Hey there, Captain Kitties. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and with this video, I'll be discussing my thoughts on episode 2 of the anime series, Psychopath 2, which was a thoroughly intriguing episode, I have to say, opening with the revelation that one of the second division has effectively killed her partner and forcer using a Dominator, after which she'd effectively taken off, hightailed it. This by itself is interesting enough, but it's made even more so as it coincides with Kitazawa, the man taken into custody last episode, first professing to having some kind of invisible helper leading him along, and then the revelation that his crime coefficient has significantly lowered to the point of his being able to be transferred to a medical security facility. Of course, after which he escapes, having more than likely had help in doing so, and injuring the second division chief inspector, Ayanagi, in the process, who later takes his life using her dominator as his crime coefficient had effectively risen again. His actions, though, having more than effectively revealed the presence of an X-Factor, if you will, or invisible partner, whom he names just before his own death as being the mystery figure we see at episode's end, Kamui. All leads point to this silent manipulator and puppet master as being integral to the origins of Kitazawa's bomb-placing endeavors in the episode previous, and his expertise in evading scanners and working around the civil system entirely via the use of hollow technology, which we find by the former hollow engineer Hinakawa's investigations, is entirely and incredibly elaborate, going so far as to be based on the likeness of a girl who died 15 years previously, but leading to his design of an appropriately aged hollow presence, as if she were still alive today. We gather from Kamui's final words that he's either doing all of this for Akane's benefit, or else he is at the very least expecting her to understand what it is he's up to, but things did not play out much as he hoped. Apart from this serving as the crux of the episode, we also see that newcomer Mika is so upset by her team's actions last episode that she's actually gone to the extent of filing a report on them, and gone to the trouble of dictating better terms they might have taken during their investigation. Gino, who has taken a very mentorish lead with her, tries to do so again in this episode, but is effectively shot down quite disrespectfully, I might add, leading Yayoi to intervene, which visibly disappoints Mika as per the rapport she apparently detects, or at least perceives, between them, being perhaps less than what Mika had expected or hoped. And we also find that Tagane's spin-off family is one of some renown in the medical business, a revelation I am sure will come into play somewhere down the line with his character as well as the fact that, much as was the case of Akane's suspicions, he too believes, before there's even evidence to promote this fact, that there is a Kamui, an X-Factor or silent benefactor working them. Interesting, too, was to see that Akane's own personal domain was infiltrated, tying to the mystery message finally semi-resolved by episode's end of the letters WC and a question mark, which may or may not relate to perhaps one's hue, as it pertains to the phrase, what color, as in what color am I, uttered before his death by Kitazawa. And it seems as though this is a message that is also being internally bandied about by Akane herself, almost to the point of obsession. Though she's also got some interesting habits of late related to lighting cigarettes and not actually smoking them. The brand no doubt sparking a level of nostalgia and perhaps reflection as it pertains to an old enforcer acquaintance. Suffice to say, this was yet another dynamic and intriguing episode, and I really can't wait to see where we go from here. So otherwise, that'll be pretty much it for me on this. I hope this video finds you well, and I'll catch you all later. Peace.